All right, the book of Job again this morning, the book of Job, chapter number 18 today, chapter number 18 of Job, as we're preaching through the book of Job on in this 11 o'clock service, Job chapter number 18. Of course, uh, we again started the book with uh, Satan and God having a conversation about Job and uh, the Lord allowing uh, Satan to do uh, whatever he wanted to do, basically, to Job, other than his, and his body, his, his, his life. And, of course, he took away all of his wealth, he took away his family, and then uh, later on took away his health. And so Job is basically a broken man as he's going through here. And then he had three friends come. Three friends. We put the friends in quotation marks, of course. Uh, uh, we have uh, Eliphaz and Bildad and Shofar, and they come to console him. Well, Job called them miserable comforters. Uh, they didn't do a very good job of consoling him. Matter of fact, they made the situation a whole lot worse. You remember Bildad started off by saying, Job, you have done something terrible. What have you done? Because God wouldn't be doing this to you if you hadn't done something bad. Well, see, that's, uh, I mean, that does happen. God allows things in our life because we have done wrong. But this was not the case here. This was certainly not the case here. Far from it. Then, of course, uh, we had uh, Bildad. He shows up and he says, well, uh, uh, listen, your kids died. And uh, uh, that's, uh, they got what they deserved. And then so far uh, shows up. And he says, Job, I don't think you've got enough bad, uh, uh, bad things that happen in your life because you've done something bad, and God should have punished you a whole lot more. Yeah. Now, boy, that's, that's real exciting. That's the kind of friends everybody needs, right? If you've got uh, friends like that, who needs enemies is what I say. But we saw Eliphaz last week. He spoke for the second time. Of course, Job has responded to these guys, and, and now Eliphaz spoke for the last time, and he was even more vicious. He says, Job, you are a terrible, hardened sinner, and you have defied the counsel of God, and God has punished you because of your wickedness. Because if you were righteous, God would be rewarding you. And see, he's got it all wrong. He's got it all wrong. Now, we know, however, that it is true that God, of course, uh, does judge people, and he deals with things. But uh, he deals with the just and the unjust in the afterlife because God will reward the righteous and he will uh, condemn the wicked. We know that. But here on this earth, the sun rises and falls on the just and the unjust. It rains on the just and the unjust. You might have a a, a neighbor, you might have a co-worker, you might have a family member who is absolutely, totally could care less about the things of God. Guess what? The sun still shines on them. And it still rains at their house. Uh, uh, Even though they may not deserve it per se. But God does that because God is good. And He's good to all. And He wants all uh, to come to repentance, right? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so He is good to all. Now, here in Job chapter 18, Bildad shows up. and he Or he's there, but he, he speaks up, I should say, for the second time. And, buddy, he just lets Job have it again. I mean, these guys are not letting up. They are getting, they are getting worse. Now, there's three points to the message today on consolation. We actually need to be consoling people when they go through adversity instead of being, beating them up, okay? You know, when somebody is, is, is beaten up, do you want to go in there and punch them some more? Or do you want to try to help them? Well, let me tell you something. We ought to be consoling and, and here we see this. All right, first point, we'll go ahead and give you this. You'll see it up on the board if you want to write it in your bulletin. Be gentle, not judgmental. Be gentle and not judgmental. Now, again, Bildad here speaks up in chapter 18. Notice what he says here in verses 1 through 4, if you would. Job 18. We're not going to read every one of these verses. We'll give you the sense of what he's talking about here. We'll read a number of them, and then we'll get into what Job says in chapter 19. Chapter 18, then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, How long will it be ere ye make an end of words? Mark, and afterwards we will speak. Wherefore are we counted as beasts and reputed vile in your sight? He teareth himself in his anger. Shall the earth be forsaken for thee, and shall the rock be removed out of his place? So here Bildad is showing that he is perturbed with Job. Job is trying to answer these guys and tell them, Listen, 
I have done nothing wrong. I don't even understand what's happening here. I have no clue why this has all happened to me. But I can assure you I've done nothing wrong in that sense. And and Bildad is even more perturbed here. He says basically, Job, shut up and listen. If you will stop your talking and you will listen to us, you'll, you'll learn something. Job, of course, in chapter 16 claimed that God had tore him up talking about what a a, a wild animal would do to its prey. But Bildad said there in verse number 4 that you are tearing yourself up with your anger. Then in the rest of this chapter, Bildad goes on to talk about the terrible fate of the wicked because he believes that Job has been very, very wicked. And he wants Job to understand what his fate is getting ready to be. Now, that's exactly what you need to do when somebody's going through adversity. And by the way, Bildad is wrong in thinking that Job's adversity is a result of his sin. In verse 5, look at it. He says, Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. In ancient times, the the light of of the candle or a lamp and or the fire were symbolic of comfort and warmth and happiness. And Bildad is telling Job here, he says, listen, your light's getting ready to be put out. Your fire's getting ready to be put out. There's not going to be any comfort for you. There's not going to be any warmth for you. There's not going to be any happiness for you because of what you've done. Because you are a filthy, dirty, rotten sinner. And God is judging you. In verses 7 through 19, Bildad says the strong steps of the wicked will be shortened. Their schemes will be their downfall. He says your, your attitude is like a snare, uh, a trap, and, and, and you've just, you, you just got these uh, frightful terrors that are frightening you. And he says, Job, you have an unrepentant attitude. And it's depleted your strength. And let me tell you, Bildad basically says, again, we're not going to read it all for time's sake, but he says disaster is awaiting you. Disaster is awaiting you. He also says, look at verse 17. He says, His remembrance shall perish from the earth, and he shall have no more name in the street. Now think about that. Here Bildad is telling Job that when your life is over, nobody's going to remember you anymore. (laughs) Wrong. (laughs) Guess who we're talking about today? Guess who's got a book in the Bible named after him? Job. He says, because you have been so bad, Job, the world is just going to forget you. That's the second wrong so far that we've seen that Bill Daddy said. That's the second one. Then he says, in verse number 19 of chapter 18, he says, he shall neither have son nor nephew among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. In other words, you don't have any kids now, and you're not going to have any kids when you die. Eh, wrong. We know the end of the story. We know that Job ended up having more kids. And they were alive when he died. How about that? So see, these people go and, 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 and they want to get on people and they want to judge people instead of being gentle with people and they end up saying the wrong things and thinking the wrong things. You better be careful. You better be careful what you start thinking. Uh, and, and listen, that's exactly what's going on here. Bildad is so wrong in, in his thinking here, and, he, and he's trying to condemn Job instead of trying to console him. He was wrong. Now, uh, look at verse number 20 of chapter 18. He says, They that come after him shall be astonished at his day, as they that went before were affrighted. In other words, people... Uh, after you are going to be appalled at your fate and people uh, are going to be horrified at what, what happened uh, to you. And let me tell you something. In one sense, yeah, we, we are uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, horrified at what happened to him because we certainly don't want that to happen to us. But you better remember the minute, the minute that you look at somebody else in their adversity and start judging them instead of, being, instead of being gentle with them because you don't know everything about everything. You don't know what God's doing. You don't even know what's all going on in that person's life. And let me tell you something. You better be careful because tomorrow you might be the one in adversity. And do you want people coming to you and saying, what'd you do wrong? What'd you do wrong? Pauline texted me this morning 
and she said that she had a stomach bug through the night. I, I started in, in jest to text her back and said, what'd you do wrong to get that? <laughs> but I didn't. But I, it did go through my mind. I said, you know, I'm preaching on Job here this morning. I said, man. And, 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 and so if, if, if something happens to you and I, and, I, and I send a text to you and say, what, what'd you do wrong? That's in jest, of course, okay? Uh, uh, get that right now. Just get it. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what people think sometimes, you know. What'd you do wrong? Listen, you better be careful what you think. You better be careful what you say. Because you may have to eat those words and eat those thoughts. He said, man, the whole world's astonished and horrified at your wickedness. At your wickedness, Job. Man, look at you. We're just horrified at it. We're amazed by it. Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, by the way, he then he goes on to say in verse 21, Surely uh, such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. Eh, wrong. I mean, Bill Dad is wrong time after time after time here. Job absolutely knew God very well. And, and I'm telling you, uh, 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 don't send me counselors like this in my life. The Bible tells us over in the book of Titus, listen to what it says. It says, speak evil of no man. Be no brawlers. Y'all ever know anybody that just likes to brawl, just wants to fight, just wants confrontation? Listen, I'm not that kind of person. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, I, I saw a, a, a TV show yesterday, a little, um, I think it was on one of them forensic files. I was looking at that, and, 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 and uh, these three boys were out. And they had just bought a, a uh, assault rifle. Now, this was years ago. This is not, uh, this is not even recent. This is years ago. And they had bought this. I don't know what they would bought it for. I didn't go into that story. But some uh, two other boys cut them off or supposedly cut them off as they was driving down the street. And the driver of the car that was cut off said, shoot that car. And so that boy took that gun out, and he shot at that car. And the passenger... And that car was hit right in the head with the bullet and died right there in that car. I'm saying, what in the world are you even thinking about? What are you thinking about? And praise the Lord, they found them and, and put them in jail. And then, do you know what one of those boys that got put in jail did? He, he, he got his sister and brother to build a bomb and send it to the parents of the boy that was in the car with him that ratted, out, ratted them out and blew up that daddy and killed that daddy in his, in his kitchen. Now, can you imagine that? And there's people, there's people out there that are confrontational, that, that want to fight, you know, and want to do something to people. The Bible says that we're not to be a brawler, but we are to be gentle, the Bible says. Gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. We're not to slander anybody. We're to avoid fighting. We're to be kind and we're to show gentleness to all. And I talked a little bit about Sunday school this morning that we're to forbear one another. And do you know why you need forbearance in your life? Because you're not always perfect either. You're not always perfect. Let me tell you something. There's things that you say that annoy and aggravate and frustrate other people. There's things you do that annoy and aggravate and frustrate other people. And, and if you think that you don't never do that to anybody, then you're wrong. And then somebody does that to you, and what do you do? Wah! You're all over them. Let me tell you something. Cut them some slack. The Bible says forbear one another. Because you need some slack cut to you. You need to be forbeared at times too. And the Bible tells us Bildad comes in here and man, he just tries to annihilate Job. How sad it is. And, all, and many of the things that he says is even wrong. He's going to be proven wrong uh, later on. And it's going to be the same way. If you want to be judgmental and you want to think you know everything about everything, and buddy, you want to lay it out, let me tell you something. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little something. Be more concerned with yourself and what's going on between you and God than you are somebody else and what's going on between them and God. How about that? You keep yourself straight. You keep yourself straight. Let me tell you something. That's a hard enough job. That's a hard enough job to keep yourself straight between you and God. Do that. Secondly, be prepared to hear frustration. Be prepared to hear frustration. Job chapter 19. Verse 
Job answered and said, How long will ye vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Now, you don't need any commentary on that. Y'all can figure that one out, can't you? These ten times, he's, he's kind of given them a round number there. He said, listen, y'all, over and over and over, you have insulted me. He said, you have reproached me. You've insulted me. Ye are not ashamed that ye make yourselves strange to me. He says, how long are y'all going to vex me? Vex. How do you like that? Vex my soul. You ever had your soul vexed by somebody? He says, how long are you going to vex my soul? How, you go, how long are you going to break me in pieces with your words? You're not ashamed that you're even doing this. You're not ashamed of the way that they have wronged him. Then he says in verse number 5, if, if indeed you will magnify, or verse 4, and be it indeed that I have erred, mine error remaineth with myself. If I've done something wrong, then that's my business. If indeed you will magnify yourselves against me and plead against me my reproach, you're, you're just using my adversity. You think that I have done something terrible. You're using my adversity as evidence that I have sinned. And then he says in verse number 6, Know now that God hath overthrown me and hath compassed me with his net. Now Job becomes exasperated. I, I'm sure that Job is probably emotionally and physically actually near death. Uh, I, uh, we don't know this for sure, but I wonder how much Job's even eaten over the last uh, a few days. And then when you have these guys uh, show up and, and beat you up like this emotionally, it, it's rough. He, he, he says, I'm like an animal in, in, a, in a hunter's net. Look at verse number 7. Behold, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. He says, I cry out to God, but it, there's no answer, and I'm protesting my lack of judgment. And then he, then he says, look at verse number 8. He says, He hath fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and He hath set darkness in my path. God has fenced me in so that I cannot escape this adversity. It's like He's been hemmed in, and He covers my path with darkness. It just looks like there's darkness out in front of me. Then He goes on to say, He hath stripped me of my glory. And taking the crown from my head, there's, there's no more strength, there's no more crown to my head, it's just humiliation. And then he goes on to say, He hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone. And mine hope hath he removed like a tree. He hath also kindled his wrath against me, and he counteth me unto him as one of his enemies. He said, it looks like, I'm an enemy of God. Now that's frustration right there. He's, he's just about had it. He doesn't understand what's going on. Let me tell you something. Listen. None of us have ever gone through what Job has gone through. But we've all gone through adversity in our life. And you can become very frustrated with that. And there's, there's people who, who, who their faith in God, in a good and loving God, is shaken. And uh, we look at a good and loving God and we say, how in the world could he allow this to happen to Job? Now we know the rest of the story, but Job didn't. In verse 12, he says, his troops come together and raise up their way against me and encamp round about my tabernacle. It, it seems, he says, it looks like I'm under attack from advancing troops. And they just keep advancing and keep advancing. And then he goes on to say, verse 13, He hath put my brethren far from me, and mine acquaintance are verily estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. In other words, basically, everybody's forsaken me. Nobody loves me anymore. Even his wife, of course, said, curse God and die. And she didn't want to have anything to do with him. And now his friends come in here, and they just beat him up. Now, I will say this. In verse 17... He says, my breath is strange to my wife. Did y'all know there was a statement of bad breath in the Bible? <laughs> Any, anybody ever had bad breath? That's why, that's why I keep these in my pocket. These little breath savers. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I, I love those videos when these little kids climb up into Santa Claus's lap and said, your breath stinks. I love seeing those things. Well, his breath is strange to his wife. Basically, 
uh, I don't think he's really saying bad, he's got bad breath per se, is the fact that she doesn't want to have anything to do with him because of, of, of his diseases and, and what his health has gone and will not get close to him. And then he says, keep on reading, he says, Yea, young children despise me, I arose, I arose and they spake against me. Young children who used to listen to what he had to say because he was a good and godly man, and they, they revered him and respected him. Now they turn their back when he stands up to speak. He said, All my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. Nobody's there for me. You can imagine the frustration. Now, maybe, maybe that's what you've said before. You said, Nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. You ever said that? You get to feeling sorry for yourself. Have a little pity party. And you say, nobody loves me. Let me tell you something. Whether you realize it or not, people do love you. People do love you. And, and if it's true that no person loves you, let me tell you something. God still loves you. God's love will never fail you. You better remember that. Don't ever, you know, Satan might can convince you that nobody loves you here on planet earth. That everybody hates you. Well, that's not true, of course. We know that's not true. But Satan would like to convince you that God doesn't love you. And let me tell you something. Do not buy into it. Do not believe it. Do not believe it. He uh, then says in verse 20, he says, My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Now, y'all probably didn't even know that. You've heard that before, man. By the skin of my teeth. That's a Bible phrase right here from Job. When you hear somebody say, by the skin of my teeth, that's where they got it from right there in the book of Job. And he, and he says, basically, I've just escaped death by the skin of my teeth. He said, I'm withering away. I am withering away. And then he says in verse 21, have pity upon me. Have pity upon me, O ye my friends. For the hand of God hath touched me. Why do you persecute me as God and are not satisfied with my flesh? Why do you persecute me? I need pity instead of persecution. Well, when people are going through adversity and they're going through tough adversity in times, be prepared for a little frustration. They're not going to be totally perfect. Now, we want to be better and not bitter, but there's going to be some frustration. There's going to be some frustration. But I got some good news for you because thirdly, be patient because he or she will recover. He or she will recover or they can recover. Let me tell you something. A lot of people go through deep adversity in their life and you know what? They come out on the other side a whole lot better. A whole lot better. Many Christians go through adversity in their life and their faith is strengthened. They are better and not bitter. Now, if you want to become bitter, you can do that. But let me tell you something. You ought to come out on the other side a whole lot better. And listen, let me tell you something. There is another side. Uh, the, the, what you're going through will pass and, and, or will get better in some way. And just hang in there. I, I'm reminded of Joseph. I don't know if you uh, remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. His brothers hated him. Now, Joseph could say, almost nobody loves me. Now, his daddy loved him. But his brothers hated him. Imagine that. His 11 brothers, or 10 brothers, hated him. And what did they do? They sold him into slavery. They sold him into slavery to a foreign land. And he moved to a foreign land where he didn't know anybody, and he, and he did not know the language, he did not know the customs. Joseph. You know what? He said, I am not going to become bitter. I am going to become better. And what did he do? He just kept on living for God. And then in the end, we know the end of the story. He was raised to be second in command of Egypt to save the world basically from a famine and to save his family from a famine. He ended up being their savior. The one they hated. Which is like the Lord Jesus Christ. He came out stronger uh, than even before. But now, don't leave me because here's a very important part of the message. Because Job is recovering here. He's coming back. Notice what he says in verse 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. 
You remember I said about old Bildad, all the things he said was wrong. We would go, eh, wrong. Well, here we go, ding, ding, right? Because he said, I wish, I wish these words were printed in a book. And guess what? They were printed in a book. He says, I wish, in verse 24, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. In other words, boy, if we could just uh, carve out a rock with all the words that I've said and put lead in there so it wouldn't go away any time. That's what I would like, engraved in a rock so that other people could see this. Then, here we go, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now Job thinks he's getting ready to die. Job thinks he's getting ready to die. Now we know that does not happen. But he thinks he's getting ready to die. And boy, he makes this statement. He says, listen, my Redeemer God will vindicate him. And notice verse 26. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now let me tell you something. Boy, that, that is all, that's almost like being on the bottom and coming right up here to the top in just a few short verses. <laughs> Because he says, and and he makes the greatest confession of faith concerning life after death found anywhere in the Old Testament. You will not find a greater confession of life after death in the Old Testament than what you just read there in Job chapter 19. He said, I know I'm going to die one day. He said, but because I know God and I know my Redeemer, I am going to see him in the flesh one day. And then he says in verse 27, Whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. He says, man, I am going to see him, and his heart is overwhelmed with the thought. Let me tell you something. When adversity comes into your life, I want you to remember something. It will pass, but there's coming a time when there will be no more adversity. There will be no more pain. There will be no more trouble. There will be no more trial. There will be no more persecution. There's coming a day. Listen, we go through life and there's adversity on every hand. Plenty of adversity to go around. I, 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 you know, you see it all the time. You, you, uh, yesterday I saw on the news that some little girl, two-year-old little girl, was in a Payless shoe store in Atlanta, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and some mirror, I don't know if she was playing with it or what was going on or if it just fell off the wall, but anyhow, a mirror fell off of the wall at a Payless shoe store, fell on her and killed her right there in that shoe store. Two years old. I told Dana again, I said, listen, there is suffering all around. There is sorrow all around. I mean, every day you see it. You, you just are, are amazed by it. But there's coming a day when there's not going to be any more adversity, no more pain, no more sorrow. And, and the, listen, we go through adversity here on earth, and a lot of times it just engulfs us, and it's all we can think about, and it, and it just takes all of our time and our energy. There's coming a day when you're going to walk through those pearly gates. And let me tell you something. You won't think about it anymore. You won't think about it anymore. You know what you're going to do for the next millions of years? You're not going to think about that. You're going to be in the presence of God. And you're going to be looking all around heaven. And you're going to be seeing the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, as Job talked about. He said, we're not even going to think about that anymore. We're not even going to talk about that anymore. Look at this place. And look who I'm in the presence of. Then he says in verse 29 to these guys, he said, Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that ye may know there's a judgment. He says, You guys think I brought all this on myself? Well, you don't even know what you're talking about. And I'm afraid God's going to bring some consequences into your life. And that way you'll know there is a judgment. Now, Job, again, needed consolation. He did not need judgment. He needed somebody to be gentle. Uh, He was frustrated, and he shared his frustration. But then we saw him start to think properly again. 
And it doesn't really matter how you feel. It's how you think. It's how you think. Let your thinking overcome your feelings. You feel like God doesn't love you. You feel like God's being mean to you. Let me tell you something. God is good and loving all the time. Let your thinking overcome your feelings at all times in your life. And you'll be a whole lot better instead of bitter. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.